I'm back, and um, I'm going to have to contain my excitement and enthusiasm sitting next to Usher, so <laughs> pardon me if I perspire a little bit. <laughs> so nice to see you all. Um, I want to start this conversation about unleashing creativity in the 21st century by reading a few lines from a Goldman Sachs equity research report, because again, this is the Milken Institute, so I've got to read something from Goldman Sachs. Um, it reads, 2023 was a turning point in the music industry in many respects, marked by the first ever major price increase by global streaming platforms, the modernization of outdated royalty payment structures, and the deployment of generative AI. It would go on to forecast global music um, uh, profits to grow at 7.9% this year. So, Larry Jackson, I'll start with you, is the former global creative director at Apple Music and longtime executive at Interscope and RCA, now one of the founders of Gamma. You say there's been a historic and meteoric shift in the way people are consuming music that is benefiting the artist more than ever. Can you uh, elaborate on that? Yeah, I would also say the audience as well. I mean, what you have, um, you know, when you, it, it's important when you, when you look at these current um, numbers and data and analytic points when you really consider the historical um, trajectory of the business, you know? In the 40s and the 50s, you know, the business was founded on uh, doo-wop records, 78s and 45s, you know, guys like uh, High Weiss and uh, Sam Phillips, you know, who created that era of the business, which a lot of the uh, economical practices still persist today. When you get into the 70s and the 80s, you have um, these independent labels like Geffen Records uh, that came about at that time. Um, but it's interesting that we're the opening act for Bill Clinton because uh, <laughs> that's, what I'll, that's what I'll get to, which frames what you just asked me. The modern business is uh, in 1996, um, Bill Clinton passed the Telecommunications Act, and that really opened the floodgates at that particular time for the consolidation of the business. Um, so that's why you have Clear Channel at that time that was vacuuming up all of these radio stations um, that paved the way for Polygram. Uh, to acquire Def Jam and to create what has become the modern day Universal Music Group, so on and so forth, right? Um, but what happened in 2012 and then what happened later in 2015, which I think accelerated everything, was streaming. And it democratized uh, the landscape, not only for the artists, but also for the audience. And you had a thumb that was being put down for that long on the business. And if I told you in 1991, you could walk into Tower Records and you can buy the entire record store for $9.99. You would tell me I was crazy, right? The entire thing for $9.99? I have all this? And that's what it created. It created the greatest buffet of all time. You know, where you could have all the music that you want. So this is why we are at the position that we are. And it's great for the artist and it's great for someone like Usher, which we'll get into right now. Um, for him to be at a label like BMG, which then became Sony. He was signed by a gentleman who's here today, a legend by the name of L.A. Reid, signed him and he signed him in 1994. He had his first album out 30 years ago. And at that time, you know, there were mom and pop labels. LaFace came up, right? You had Jive, uh, you had uh, Arista, you had Bad Boy, you had all these labels at that time. You had a plethora of choices if you're Janetta Patton, right? If you're Janetta Patton, you're in Tennessee, you want to get your baby a record deal, you got a lot of places you could go to in addition to L.A. Reid, of course, right? Janetta Patton's my mother. Janetta Patton's, is, yeah. <laughs> Shout out to Miss Patton. Um, but you know, it, 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 the business became consolidated after that 1996 Telecommunications Act, and we're still living in the wake of that. But we're really right now living in the wake of streaming. And I was happy to have spent eight years at Apple to be able with Jimmy Iovine and Trent Reznor, uh, architect Apple Music, and build what has created uh, an opportunity for not just the kid in his bedroom or her bedroom, but for Usher to be able to leave a monolithic institution like he did and succeed, to be the first independent artist to ever play the Super Bowl, to be the only artist in the music business last year who went number one in three formats. And to do, and to do it, and to do it independent and in just as strong of a way as he would if he were at RCA. 
Well, I, I want to dig into what that means to be independent at, at this stage in your career, but Usher, as Larry just said, it's hard to believe that you first released your first album 30 years ago, because you still look exactly the same. I don't know how you do it, like exactly the same, maybe even better, but anyway. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Tell me how like you I really said, feel about me. Like I said, like I said. <laughs> but, but in order to understand this meteoric shift that, that Larry's talking about, I wonder if you could just take us back to when you first started in this business. What was it like for a young usher coming up in the music industry? Well, first and foremost, I, I want to uh, recognize uh, this in amazing uh, institute uh, that after 20 years of its existence, uh, we're able to share this story, a very incredible story that goes all the way back to my beginning, but more than anything, one, a room uh, of individuals who want to learn more about our industry and really show diversity uh, in, the, in terms of how we conduct business and, and, and what our understandings are of business. So I want to first and foremost say that, but um, coming from Chattanooga, Tennessee, there were not a lot of opportunities. Um, you know, you, uh, you, you aspire to, to, to be as great as your environment. So we moved to Atlanta, Georgia, my mother, uh, my stepfather. Um, you know, but my desire to be an artist and share my creativity uh, based off of my exposure uh, was as grand as my options. Having a label like LaFace Records that I'd heard um, existed and also too was building in Atlanta gave me uh, the hope that this city of opportunity, this city of, um, of belief could, uh, could guide me safely uh, to this journey that now 30 years later I can talk about. But yeah, uh, the opportunity that we have now to speak directly to a consumer, uh, to establish a relationship uh, that is direct with your consumer, those opportunities didn't exist. Furthermore, the understanding of the business did not exist. Had it not been for uh, Don Passman and the book that he published, my mother would have known nothing about this industry uh, and what, what knowledge she did, she still was left to make decisions uh, that were based off of a standard that was set, um, of which um, you know a, a, a lot of the uh, rights that now artists don't necessarily uh, have to give away earlier uh, as a result of being able to speak directly to their consumer. Um, they don't have to go in, they don't have to take that same journey, but nonetheless, I did, uh, very happy uh, that I was able to garner all of the experience, hit records and information, and also to business sensibility to be able to finally have my own opportunity and then find partnership. Uh, and someone who was defined enough to, you know, work to change the standard and also to help me tell this story. What do you mean you had, had to give away all your hmm? rights? What I, when, when you talk about giving away your rights, yeah. What do you mean by that? Well, not necessarily giving away, but you know, a, a, the understanding of this industry um, in the beginning was you sign to a major label, there's artist development that comes with it, your creativity, as much as it may mean something, you still need to develop uh, and you need to understand who your consumer is as opposed to what happens now where the artist dictates directly having a relationship with their audience. Um, but those rights um, to, uh, to have a recording career are within a contractual kind of uh, binding agreement. Um, so now looking forward as an independent artist, rather I'm encouraging artists to you know, continue to do what they've naturally done or I, they even inspired me to do um, in being an independent artist is just to understand and, and, and hopefully as you know, time has gone by even though now streaming is more relevant than tangible copies. It's like, I don't know if it's a great thing that you can get all that music for 99 cents. I, <laughs> 999. 9.99. <laughs> I'm sorry, the 99 same made same a difference. <laughs> but yeah, man, it's, it's crazy. But here is the reality. Uh, there's so many other opportunities for these young entrepreneurs. They're not just artists. And they know who they are and they know who their consumer is. So having that ability to speak directly to um, your consumer is, is, is a great benefit. Um, I mean, as he said, I'm the first independent artist to play the Super Bowl. 
what an accomplishment, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, and maybe both of you can and just explain what the biggest difference between what your situation was like before and what it, what it actually means to be an independent artist now. What does it entitle you to, to be an independent artist? And it, it, it entitles me to um, dictate the, narr the narrative. Uh, as an entrepreneur, to establish things that matter to my fans as well as to me. Uh, it, it gives me the opportunity to control um, you know, my, the, create, the creative process that I have, uh, the partnerships that I choose, um, as well as uh, monetize that. In, uh, in everywhere outside of touring or live performance, but there's so many partnerships that, that are gone in, uh, in having the ability to kind of leverage what I'm creating. And, and Larry, what, what are the forces that led up to an artist like Usher being able to have that agency in becoming an independent artist? I mean, again, it was really, um, it was streaming. It was streaming. Um, you know, it, it, it once was, uh, and by the way, for the record, I think the, the major record labels do an incredible job. Um, I'm not part of the chorus that says that they will be extinct. I think that, you know, you hear that enough. I think uh, that we'll always have a place. I, I'm not coming from that kind of uh, mean spirit of a place. Um, but what we're doing is different. <laughs> and we're not a label, um, as evidenced by the fact that when Usher did the Super Bowl that weekend, uh, he had the number one selling album that weekend, right? And that was achieved by, in, you know, really inventive thought. He and I had a lot of conversations and a lot of deliberation around how we were going to pull that off on a commercial level. And one of the things that we did uh, is that we called our friend Kim Kardashian. And we turned... Who? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we, call, we called our friend Kim Kardashian, and Usher uh, very graciously decided to appear in a Skims ad. Uh, that same week. But it wasn't the ad that was the point. The point is that we wanted to not just rely on $9.99 a month, $9 .99 a month. You, get all, you, you got all, all the music that you can have. We wanted to uh, have a real artist to fan um, music commerce marketplace. So we were able to, with Billboard and with Luminate, turn skims in the skim site. So you go on and you buy a t shirt, you buy a bra, you buy a pair of underwear. In the checkout line, you're also able to buy Usher's album, Coming Home. And the plan went together in a very seamless way from a music commerce marketplace perspective. It really created, we really turned Skims into iTunes. So that's how he was able to achieve, not just relying on streaming, but to think in a more enterprising way of how I can reach my fans in different venues and different places. Um, but what it means to be an independent artist right now, I'll give you an example. I mean, the biggest debut album of this week is from a young man who probably a lot of people, if you're not part of Gen Z, who haven't heard of by the name of Thorbats out of Dallas. Uh, he has a number three album right now on Apple Music behind Taylor Swift and Future. Hmm. Crazy. Probably never even heard of this young guy, right? You will, because he's about to be a threat. And when Jimmy Iovine and Trent Reznor and I sat and we were coming up with Apple Music uh, with Eddie Q in 2014, after the acquisition of Beats at Apple, we always really sat and we, we, we um, reflected on what it would be like to be the kid uh, in his or her bedroom creating music and how they could reach the world. We actually even came up with a part of uh, Apple Music called Connect, where anybody could upload the music and get it out. Um, didn't quite work that well. You know, SoundCloud was still dominant, but the, it was the intent. So now, that was 2015. Fast forward nine years later, Forbats is actually the kid in his bedroom. And he got his music out very quickly. A year ago, people didn't even know about him. Today. He has a number one record on radio right now, and he's got the number three album on Apple Music, and that's what it's like to be an independent artist right now. So you could either be Usher, you could be a 19-year-old young man um, from Dallas, Texas, and you can achieve greatness, and that's what it's like right now in this business. Is he the anomaly, though, Larry? I mean, Usher has had this really incredibly lengthy, successful career, and I would venture to guess one of the reasons is because there has been this machine behind him, right? What about those young kids in their bedroom who don't have the power of that machine? Forbats is not an anomaly. You've got Sexy Red, you've got Tommy Richmond. I could keep going. You've got Peso Pluma, you've got even Bad Bunny. P Bad Bunny's huge right now, but people forget Bad Bunny's an independent artist through the orchard. 
Now you're still connected to Sony, but there's some level of independence that's there. But the others are actually even more independent. Sexy Red, who's with us at Gamma, is probably the biggest breakout new artist star in the music business right now. Period. You know, she's huge. And she's independent. And she's not through Universal, she's not through Sony, she's not through Warner, you know? And, you know, because at Gamma we had the, the blessing and the opportunity to be able to work with someone like Usher that attracted other moths to the flame of Gamma, that's how Sexy Red came about, October London came about, Four Bats came about. Everybody wants to be where the party's at, and Usher created that for us. Um, has the method of finding artists changed for you? It's a good question, actually. Somebody asked me that the other day. Because uh, it used to be, as Ron Lafitte knows, Ron Lafitte, uh, who's Usher's manager, is here. Uh, Ron Lafitte, if I'm correct, Ron, started his career uh, hanging out with Metallica in their garage, right? <laughs> Am I wrong about that? Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so Ron, right at that time, was that 1980? I don't want to date you. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> at 1981, you said it, not me. So at that time, there was Max with Kansas City, right? There were CBGBs, there was the bottom line. That's where the A&R guys went to go hang out to go find the records, right? The Roxy, right? Ain't nobody talking about that kind of shit no more. They're like, yo, this shit is, is going crazy on TikTok, it's number one on Instagram Reels. I mean, that's how wild the A&R process has changed where at that time, you know, Ron was hanging out with Lars Ulrich in his garage, you know, listening to demos. Guys who were, and, and women who were a&R people for the biggest labels were at Max's Kansas City and CBGB's Discovering Acts. I gotta tell you, I don't hear that no more. Hmm. It's all online discovery, you know? Um, you call what's happening in the mu music industry a great democratization. So how does this benefit artists in ways that it couldn't in, under previous structures? Well, I'll say one thing, right? Uh, recognizing L.A. Reid, who is in the audience tonight, um, what? who his hey, entire Ellie label. <laughs> wow, Ellie Reed's here. <laughs> was crafted and constructed with the theory that l longevity is based on preparation and the better prepared artists are. There are labels like what we have established. Great that we've traveled around the world and we've now are able to bring our world experience back together and develop artists like Sexy Red, be able to find those artists who have a flash in the pan, even though it feels like the most grand moment ever, and oh my God, you're amazing. Longevity is great songs. Longevity is understanding artist development. Longevity is understanding building a touring career. Longevity is understanding the craft and also to making certain that you are articulating your message properly to a brand, a, a broad audience. So having labels like ours give that opportunity after recognizing uh, the talent to develop them still. Yeah. And Larry, how can a, a, a company like Gamma even help artists to have that foresight to think about longevity in this industry? By the way, shout out L.A. Reid once again. <laughs> Great. We can't shout out L.A. Reid enough. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm saying that in particular because to answer your question, one of the first things that I was proud to do with L.A. and Usher um, Usher owns his music. I don't own his music. I'm his partner. I don't own his music, right? And I remember when I was sitting down to talk to Eddie Q about the thesis of Gamma, and I started off by saying, what if it's possible for it to be the fact that in order for you to win, someone else doesn't have to lose? Right? So... Usher's still got to work on getting a reversion on Confessions and My Way and 8701 and all those albums. He owns Coming Home Today. I'm his partner. It's like, it's like uh, I'm on the board of, of, of the Hammer, right? We do an exhibition. We don't own those paintings. Those paintings are out on loan to us. We hold those paintings for two, three years. We do uh, exhibitions. We showcase those paintings. We sell tickets off of those paintings, but we don't own those paintings, right? The collector, the person who bought the painting, owns the painting, or the artist has the painting out on loan to us. That's what we're saying. Someone doesn't have to lose in order for us as a business to succeed, prosper, and win. So how, though, specifically, 
um, are artists benefiting? You're saying because now they can actually own their own their music, which right. they couldn't do under previous structures. No, not at all. And by the way, um, I'm proud to say, knock on wood, wherever it's at, it's working. That that theory, that thesis, that premise. I mean, we. Uh, we raised capital recently um, within a year at a 420 million post money valuation. Uh, the business is doing well. We're the fastest growing distribution technology company in the world right now. Um, we're growing it right now, I'd say probably six, over 60 to 70 percent year over year. Um, it, it's working, that, that, that premise and that thesis. You know? I mean, the argument could be made that uh, you know, it doesn't make, it doesn't, it doesn't make uh, there's no successful business people that are kind people. <laughs> You got to kill, right? But we don't believe that. We don't. We believe that Usher and L.A. Reid, who made their music, with we are just the custodians. That's it. That's it. And we have the same arrangement with Snoop and the Death Row catalog, with all of our artists in that particular way. And I'm so proud of that because the thing that made me leave Apple was the fact that there was all of these meetings that I was taking all the time. And I'm like, man, there's got to be a better way. This is crazy. I can't believe these people are here speaking about these artists like that and all that. I don't want to get into it, but um, I was, I was, I really was imbued with the passion to do this um, because of my experiences and the things that I had an allergic reaction to that I saw, that I witnessed, that I overheard. You know. Uh, I have to just take a minute to ask you about uh, the generative AI revolution. Mm. In what ways do you see AI as really benefiting the industry, and in what ways do you see AI? threatening artists in the industry? Mr. Raymond? Hmm. Well, um, I'm the only me that I can be. <laughs> so even if there are, uh, are um, ways to activate and create content, um, I think it's a, it's a matter of how creative we can be and how um, honest we are with what we consider um, content that is legendary content that is sustainable, creative art. And um, the one positive thing that I could potentially see is there's a great deal of incredible artists who are no longer with us. If there is a way for us to satisfy um, the audience that still is longing for that connection to that audio artist, then there is some value there. Uh, it can be very dangerous um, with the manipulation of that tool. But again, um, I think it is a matter of us understanding the value between the two, the creator and the creative. So as long as I'm here, I'm going to do my best to never let AI beat me. <laughs> you have better. no idea what it's like for Usher to be looking me in the eyes going, I'm the only one of me. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> uh, Larry, how about you? What do you think? Is AI, <laughs> how, will, how, how will AI benefit the music industry and, and what are some of the threats that it presents? Um, I, I've actually spent a lot of time thinking about this. Um, you know, not only from... Um, I sit, on, I sit on the board of directors of a really cool company called ServiceNow. It's an enterprise software company uh, run by my friend Bill McDermott as the chairman and CEO of the company. Um, and I would say probably we are, we are probably one of, of, of a few companies. I probably count them on one hand, NVIDIA being another one. Uh, we actually are turning a profit out of generative AI. It's not just a buzzword or something we're throwing around like NFTs, crypto, or Web3. Uh, it's something that we're really harnessing and finding a way to uh, automate the workflow for uh, the businesses that we back. Um, so I've been looking at it through that lens for the last couple of years before it became in vogue. Um, and its applicability in the way I've thought about it with respect to our business is in something that I actually would like to announce today. Um, so what we've been able to do with generative AI, we've been able to actually automate it as such where we can do a real-time revenue calculator on what Usher, for instance, can earn next week, following week, next month, six months from now. And that's only, became, that's only been made possible with generative AI, you know? So we went as far as to uh, dream and think, and now I can announce, uh, for the premium tier of clients, and we will continue to roll it out over 
uh, the course of the next probably 18 months. But right now, uh, as of today, uh, for the premium clients at Gamma, they're going to start to get paid once a week. And why that is impactful, let me tell you why. Uh, the record labels right now, where Usher came from, he was at RCA, they accounted to him on a biannual basis at best. I don't mean like every May 31st or every like December 31st, but like whatever the fuck they felt like a biannual basis at best, right? Excuse my language. Um, <laughs> but, but that's the truth, you know? So to be able to do this, and what I'm saying is not just some pipe dream, hypothetical, probable thing, but we actually have it in beta right now. Shout out to uh, my friends Russ and Milan, one of the biggest independent artists in the world, Russ from Atlanta as well. He actually is getting paid by us already now on a once a week basis. So to be able to have that offering for our clients to be able to pay them, backed and powered by generative AI on a once a week basis versus biannual, you tell me where you want to come. I mean, that's a revolutionary development. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Run tell that. So. <laughs> Well, so, so there's a lot of capital in this room. There's a, a lot of capital in this building. Where would you point uh, investors if they are wanting to invest in you know, aspects of the industry, but most importantly to uplift emerging artists? Uh, where would I invest? Uh, I would invest in Usher and Flippers. I would invest <laughs> in... <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I think, you know, you've got to talk about a business that's in its ninth consecutive year of growth. Uh, you're talking about uh, the democratization has come by way, to answer your question from earlier more specifically, 84% of the music that is consumed in the United States right now is all through the mobile phone. That is the reason why you could be successful, because it's all democratized, right? You could either have a record label in your pocket, you have all the music that you can eat in your pocket. Um, so I, I mean, this, this business right now, if you, you know, go off the Goldman Sachs report, Music in the Air report that you were quoting, uh, the trajectory doesn't show any signs of slowing down past the year 2030. So I would invest. I mean, I will say this, I mean, because I, I, I know I'll, I'll be Usher's publicist right now, too. What <laughs> L.A. and Usher and Jante and Ron uh, and Christina and Ron's whole team have pulled off is nothing short of amazing. This man has 10 nights sold out at O2 Arena in London coming up. How many nights in, in L.A., Ron? Uh, four in L.A., but six in the show, two and a half nights. Six nights in L.A. I mean, this, for where he's at right now, and to have gone through that valley, but to come back up, to soar to a peak that is, is higher than arguably it's ever been for him in his career, I think needs a round of applause because... <laughs> You think it could have happened if you weren't an independent artist? Come again? You think it could have happened if he weren't, if, if he didn't go the independent route? I dare to say I don't believe that it would. <laughs> what do you think, Usher? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I would venture to say that um, our past teaches us something very valuable, um, that we have to be connected and live in this moment and be present, understanding that technology and also to rooms like this where there's partnership and opportunity for deal flow creates better opportunity for young entrepreneurs like myself and <laughs> others for the future. So um, with that, I say I'm happy for what has happened. I'm happy that I've also too had the experiences that I've had in the past, which now fuels um, our ambition to create a better solution for the future. Yeah, and by the way, uh, shout out to the whole Gamma team that's in the house. Um, Ike Youssef, uh, the greatest president CFO to ever do it, Reza, Natalie, Mika, shout out to Angie from The Shade Room, these lights are so bright, but shout out to Angie, we're launching our first podcast together uh, with Rick Ross coming up in a minute, um, and you know, we've talked about our respective uh, perspectives, but none of this, as Usher would agree to, um, I'm sure agree with rather, is, is not possible without our teams that are in the house, so no nothing but love to everybody who's here, and you know, I can't see anybody, but shout out to all y'all who are in the room. Yeah. Well, since we are the opening act for Bill Clinton, as you said, yeah. I want to thank you all so much for spending some time with us today. Larry Jackson and Usher, everyone, thank you. Yeah.